So we want to welcome everyone to Precog time number 30, unbelievably, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, where we have the great pleasure and honor of talking with Katie Gegenheimer and Jenny Snyder, two artists and friends who are going to be featured in issue six of Precog magazine, having a conversation with one another about um, how they met, their artwork, and in this case is also um, one of uh, an hopefully accumulating series of interviews by Katie, um, which will hopefully turn into a book about the relationship between artists and teaching or teaching networks and pedagogy, um, which is a really great conversation in the sixth issue. And we just thought it would be a great opportunity to talk with Katie and Jenny uh, more about their actual artworks and less about teaching as a practice. Um, so uh, before we start asking them all questions, we just wanted to also plug Katie's going to be in a group show opening on Saturday at Gross McLeaf, uh, Gross McLeaf Gallery in Philly. Um, the name of the show is titled Bouquet and Katie has amazing new um, works going up in there. So if you're in the area, check it out. And uh, we just wanted to start the conversation like we always do by asking both of you how your pandemic has been or what you've been what you've been doing through the past now um, 12 and a half months, um, what you've been working on and what life has been like for you in this time. Jenny, you want to start? No. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> That's fine. Um, thanks, Gabby and Flo, for having us, too. And thanks, Jenny, because I'm really excited to be doing this with you. Um, the pandemic, well, I guess one of the great parts has been being able to have some time to connect with people in more meaningful ways um, than when I, you know, was outside going places all the time. I feel like it's made my conversations a little bit more thoughtful. Um, so like Jenny, I mean, I feel like you and I were able to really dig in. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I teach at Tyler and I'm an administrator. So I've learned um, succinctly the meaning of the word pivot this year and how many times one can pivot. Um, yeah, but I am generally really lucky um, and have nothing to complain about. And as an artist, can thrive being almost alone um, for the most part, too. So I don't know. It's more, um, it's just been frustrating to watch it all play out. But I'm excited that we're getting toward a brighter moment with all the vaccines that are out. Um, so that's like a possibility that maybe we didn't know was a possibility a few months ago. So feeling a little bit more optimistic. Well, thank you also for having us. Um, my experience has been, um, I think, a little darker than that. Um, I found that the uh, the isolation was very unusual. Mm -hmm. um, I depend a lot on being able to see my friends mm -hmm. and move about freely and go into the city mm -hmm. and see art. And I haven't been in New York since for over a year. And this is the first time that's ever happened. And it, it's been very hard. And in addition, we've lost a number of friends and family. And uh, it's been very scary too, being, uh, Vulner feeling so vulnerable. I never felt um, as conscious of, of aging and end of life stuff. I just never thought about that. But the last even, I think 
four or five years has been just awful. <laughs> and I, I put 2016 forward as just the prelude to the pandemic. So it's just been very crazy making. Although at least one thing that happened during that time would have been your and Katie meeting one another. Is that right? Is that when that show was or was it before? It was, it was in 2017. Yeah, so oh, Katie- That's right, that's right. I mean, not to say that the misery doesn't come hand in hand with the joy, right? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we yeah. met. You oh, go tell ahead, Jen. the story. You tell the story. Very okay. Well. And you can let me know if my memory is accurate too. Yeah, I will. Okay. Um, well, I actually remember very vividly going to see, I think I was living in Connecticut at the time, actually. And um, I think it was before I was going off for the summer at Yale Norfolk to go work there. And this Marsden Hartley show had opened at the Met Breuer. And I was like, I need to see this before I go. Like, if there's the last show I see before the summer, like in nature, it's this show. Um, and so I went with my husband, um, Mark, and, you know, I am such a huge Marston Hartley fan. Like, I felt like I was elated. I could have been skipping through the show and it would have been my true reaction because I thought the paintings were so beautiful. Um, and actually, I... I went through the show on my own uh, for the most part and got toward the end um, by the elevators. And I remember seeing this incredible painting and, I, and then there was another person there looking at it. <laughs> and it was so exciting to me because I was kind of flipping out and it was this painting that Gabby just pulled up. And I remember looking at it and those edges of orange, I really remember like almost like the carved nature of the orange in this field of like really sophisticated grays. And I was looking at it closely and I loved it. And then there was this person in, in proximity to me that I felt the same kind of energy of excitement looking at a painting. And I think we all know as artists, when you're at a museum with another artist, how you look at paintings versus looking at paintings with like just someone who's at the museum, like having a day off or whatever. And I could feel that Jenny was looking at it with the same kind of eyes that I was. And so I think that that's how it started, that we started talking. Cause I think I was like, isn't this great? <laughs> Is that kind of right, Jenny? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, and I had gone to the show by myself and many of the paintings I had seen before at other shows. And when I got to this painting, I just, it literally stopped me in my tracks because not that I was rushing because it was an extraordinarily beautiful show, but it looked, and, and you can almost see that in this slide. It looks like it, there was a light bulb on behind it. Mm -hmm. The light was, was so extraordinary and so um, it didn't look like a painting. It looked like a like a, a piece of glass, you know, that had a light shining through it with paint on it. it and it just was breathtaking. And I saw this wonderful young woman, Nick, standing there looking at it. And I just had to say how wonderful this was to another human being. <laughs> to, 
and to enjoy the fact that someone else was seeing what I was seeing. And that's how we met. So there's something um, really kind of evocative um, about the way that Katie was just talking about um, finding someone with the same eyes. And Jenny, I think, you know, as you're talking about this kind of uh, pretty rare experience of encountering someone, like encountering a painting with someone in the same way, there's this sort of like kindred looking that can happen in this manner. Um, and it seems to be a pretty interesting way of thinking about um, how we find ourselves in relation with others, right? If we can think about our artist lineage or artist community as people with whom we share uh, like eyes or something like this. Um, and it seems like that's something which really has connected you, that you have this kind of, uh, this, this uh, trust in the fact that you can look in a similar way or that you can trust um, your experiences of looking with one another. Um, and because I think the context of your, your relationship has so much to do with the idea of lineage, um, both clearly because you've influenced Katie, uh, Jenny, in terms of who you are and how you are as an artist, um, but also just because in your interview, you, you talk a lot about the different influences that you have. Um, I, was wondering if you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to influences, this idea of kindredness um, and how you're thinking about that kind of connectivity inside and outside of your studios. Well, the other part of this meeting mm. was we introduced ourselves and it turned out that we were both, we had both gone to Yale. And, uh, and of course I said, oh, well, who did you study with? Because I have maintained some connection to the people at Yale. And um, the first person you mentioned, I think, Katie, was Rochelle, right? Rochelle Feinstein. And Rochelle had been my student <laughs> at Columbia a million years before. So we had this, I mean, I, Katie is actually the second granddaughter that I have, art granddaughter. Um, the first one is a woman named Carla, who you may know, Carla Wozniak. You know her? She, she's a Yale too. And she studied with Rochelle. And she was at the Sharp Foundation when I was there. And I was the elder there. And there was Carla, and she was my first grandchild. And so it's a very peculiar, um, for me, uh, and very precious kind of connection that I felt for forever with my former students who are many of whom are now practicing artists, but now there's a whole nother generation of you. And it's, um, it's quite surprising in a way to be this old and still remember that as a teacher, when I started teaching, I wasn't much older than my students my college students and and i i still sort of puzzle over actually the passage of time that there is this much time between when i was a student when i started teaching when i stopped teaching and the other, one more answer to another part of your question is that I, 
I've looked very much at very different artists in the course of my life in the studio. Um, but when I, when I went back to Hartley the other day because of this conversation, I was so struck by how important his work remains to me and how relevant it is, how unbelievably powerful it is. And, you know, it's very different from, you know, being a high school art student and falling in love with Medigliani, say, you know, it's not something that, that's not something that lasts, but this and Gustin, I mean, they last, they stay with you forever. That's it. <laughs> I don't know, I think you covered it. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I don't even know what to say after that, really. Um, that's like, that's beautiful, Jenny. Um, yeah, I, for me, lineage, I mean, I was so excited to meet Jenny and have our intersection of that we had studied from the same place. And then, then we had this like amazing person, like as this kind of link to that felt just so meaningful to me. Um, and I felt like it started to tell me um, something bigger about myself and where I could locate myself in the world. Um, not only like as an artist, but as a human being. Um, I, I think about lineage all the time and almost the shared looking or understanding or sensitivity. I mean, at a certain point, someone has taught me to like slow down and look at things <laughs> and then how to understand them. Um, and so for me, I think about that starting when I was a student at Tyler, um, like very vividly um, being taught how to look and um and i owe it all to the people who taught me you know and then to the people i learned next to too um who who taught me the other 50 percent, i guess um mm -hmm. along the way but yeah i mean i i have nothing without the community right like i i don't know what terrible painting i'd be making <laughs> if i was left to my own devices um, without all the good people who have kind of like given me a hard time along the way. Um, so yeah, and I, you know, sometimes I think about, I don't know if you would remember this Gabby or I don't, I don't remember, but when we were in grad school, um, when Rob was teaching that what the fuck is painting class, <laughs> he had us write our artist family tree. Um, to try to look back to, to try to be like, okay, yeah, I might like someone who's in a gallery now, sure, but that depth of understanding is like not helpful to anyone. <laughs> but how do you go back further and further and further? And who would who look at and where does that history reside? Um, and I I have what I did when I was in grad school, and then I try to actually redo that. And now it's getting really exciting, actually, because I can actually situate myself in conversations um, and continue to fantasize about conversations. I know I said this to Jenny, but like when I was an undergrad, um, Stanley Whitney would say this thing where he was like, you are never alone in your studio. Mm -hmm. Like you always have all of art history there with you if you so choose as you should. <laughs> um, and I always think about that in, you know, how I explore painting most specifically. So I want to make sure that we, sorry, Jenny, were you going to say something? Well, I have a question, but go ahead. I'll remember. Oh, I was just going to say, I want to um, get to looking at both of your works. Um, and so I was going to uh, suggest that we talk a little bit about um, nouns so both of you and which is why this talk was called person place thing so 
um, both of you uh, mentioned that nouns as an aesthetic idea play an important role in how to make a work for you. Um, and as we were thinking about the work together, Flo and Kelly and I commented that both of you treat the surface of your works as a kind of object. Um, in Katie's case, that could be a chest or a lace tablecloth or a vase of flowers. Um, and in Jenny's case, uh, the, the nounish element of things often comes into play in terms of a visual schematic or a diagram um, in some cases or maps. Um, so nouns declare subjects and they're also concrete. Um, and I was wondering if both of you could talk about your relationship to this kind of object grammar in your work um, and maybe to the idea of concrete things. Jenny, noun is your word. <laughs> well, I was never interested in space. Um, as much as I loved Cezanne, it was, I came to Cezanne after graduate school, um, fortunately. Um, because in graduate school, there was, at the time, this is the 60s, this emphasis on foreground, far ground, moving, even moving through space. And that was the the formal basis of painting language in academic for some of my teachers. And it, it didn't make any sense to me because that's not the way I saw the world. I saw the world in terms of um, things and um, objects and people. And so when I finally was able, I think if you go to the, the taxis, um, it's uh, the wooden ones, go down. Number seven. Yeah. When, when I started um, eliminating everything but the thing, then I could paint the objects inside the edge any way I wanted. Um, and I could make any kind of space and um, any kind of um, image. It could be as abstract, as, as, uh, as illusionistic, as comical, as grid-like as anything. But it gave me a great freedom to not have to worry about anything but the name of the thing and not, you know, well, how do he get from the front to the back, which was not interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love that you don't care about space. <laughs> Because I don't either. <laughs> I don't even think that I see space, <laughs> which, which I actually feel true. Like I don't see perspective. It's like an ongoing joke between my husband and I that I like really, I can't draw in perspective. I see it all in reverse. Um, so I don't care about space either. And I also don't care about al illusions. I don't try to make like illusionistic windows. I don't think of the painting as a window to another <laughs> world. That has nothing to do with anything that I care about particularly. Um, I'm really interested 
in the painting being the site. The thing. The thing. Yeah. The place, the site, the location of the action that occurred and the canvas or the stretcher or like Gabby, if you show those um, number four, like, or like the signboard, like <laughs> whatever the structure is, is what allows me to make the painting. Um, but the goal wasn't for these, like I made these over the pandemic as a gift for a friend. Um, they had loaned me this board for, for my wedding <laughs> and I told them I'd give it back in better condition than I had gotten it. So then I made them these, this two-sided painting so that if they had a change of mood or if they want to turn it from like daytime to nighttime beach scene, they could do it. But it gave me the opportunity to just work on a painting and form and color um, and humor in some ways too. Um, and actually like what I'm really concerned with in, in person, place or thing is actually like the people and the places and who I'm trying I don't know, to make these works for. Like, I always think about audience and audience is really the people I love for better or for worse. Um, I, I'm, I'm really genuine about it, actually. Um, I'm, it's not, um, it's, it's just, it's what I really think about when I'm making the work. So yeah, I love not caring about space. And having the agency over that choice in like our painting world. Katie, what does that mean for you when you're painting something like a landscape um, for you to approach, for you to approach the image um, to extend this conversation without space, for instance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think about it as a way to just record uh, time, but like time of making more than, um, like this, this idea, so this painting is called Weather Shift. And I was, I'd walked by a puddle and seen the clouds in it. And so then I was like, that's something that I wanna paint. Um, but I didn't go out and plain air paint it. Even if I had, it probably still would have turned out this way, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I think I'm trying to make the spaces that I want to be, be in and occupy and Sometimes it's just not here. Like I, I would rather create the other dimension um, and be in the other dimension and engaged with the questions of the other dimension, um, which the canvas allows me to do um, however I so choose. And it, and it lets me just ask questions. Like I'm critically thinking about color when I'm making these or form um, or balance um structure yeah um to return back to um thinking about you know the idea of space and how it might be different from place jenny i was wondering if you could talk a little bit your work often has to do with specific geographies um, whether that's an urban landscape often, or there, there are a lot of um, maps, historical references. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that in your work and how this might be or not be noun-ish. I mean, I don't know, we can also let that go, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Go to number 20. Yeah. Okay. Um, I start, this is actually the only piece I did during the epidemic. I mean, last year, this is 2020. And in the center, can, can you see my little cursor? No. no? Okay, um, well, yeah. the form in the center 
is a map of the Pale of Settlement, which was the place the, the Russian Empire put the Jews uh, starting in the um, early to mid 19th century. Um, so this entire area, which includes what is now, um, it, you can see Crimea, there's the Ukraine, um, there's parts of present day Russia, there's parts of Poland. Um, it's a huge ghetto. It was a huge ghetto. And, um, and the title of the painting is Beyond the Pale. And I had started thinking about these maps um, earlier in the year. I don't know when it happened. Somebody in the audience might remember this, but um, on NPR, Mike Pompeo gave an interview um, during uh, the, uh, the first impeachment trial about the, about the Ukraine. And after the interview was over, he, he had a private meeting with the reporter, um, Mary Louise Kelly, I think her name is. And he was abusive, verbally abusive to her. And one of the things he said to her was, well, I'll bet you can't even find Ukraine on the map, on a map. And of course, since she was a very serious woman and had been a reporter in the area, she, of course, went right up to the map and pointed to it. So I started doing um, little paintings of maps of the Ukraine. And then I realized that right on one of the rivers that you see is where my father's parents came from. Um, and my mother came from the part that was part of Poland, the kingdom of Poland. Um, and I realized that many of my friends from childhood and from high school and my husband, we all come from that same neighborhood. Um, and so I started drawing these maps because, and I actually, you know, I did it the way you're supposed to. I gridded up the little maps on this paper, and then I gridded my canvas, and I was very specific about following the contour of the country of this, this, um, this place, I mean, that doesn't exist. It's just a made up thing, which is what maps really are, all maps. So um, it turned into a very, uh, intense um, investigation, not just of family and the past, um, but uh, 
of line, I became very interested in the fact that the edge of the map was very much like drawing the edge of the leaf that was in the painting. You know, some of my leaves I do from my head, but more and more I've been really looking at real leaves. So, um, that's, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what the maps are about right now. And um, what about like the map, are, the way that you talked about everybody being from the same town on the same river started making me think about like all of these leaves falling from the same tree. Well, I started doing the leaves um, after my father died um, because, you know, I lived in the city most of my life. So I'm not a person who has real mm -hmm. country experience. But um, in the fall, in the city, you always look at the sidewalk and the leaves on the ground. And I started drawing leaves. And um, I think that like a lot of other things in my paintings, they're about loss and they're about death. And uh, and when we move to this house, we have an oak tree in the backyard, and there are oak leaves in my studio <laughs> on the floor. So I feel very much like they've followed me into the present. <laughs> And they, I think family, the trees are really about family. The, the logs and the, and the pictures of trees are really about how many people are in a family for me. Um, and, um, That's it. <laughs> um, Katie, I had a question for you. Can you talk about flowers? <laughs> because we're talking about leaves and I was like, I think there's like this connection between both of you, you know? Yeah, but you know, uh, I, I mean, I really love to hear Jenny talk about the leaves in that way. Um, and, and I guess it makes me think about flowers in the way that I use them in my work. Um, in that I'm not really thinking about growth necessarily, um, but I think about uh, transitions. And I always think about like flowers as like um, an offering or, you know, something you give to someone when something great happens, when something terrible happens and it marks time and they live and they die. And, and there's this kind of transitional moment. Um, I never paint the dead flowers. Um, maybe it's like the optimist in me. I can't imagine doing that. Um, but, but I use them as a device to try to like um, memorialize things, um, to try to set time to things and passage uh, to moments, I guess, is how, how they function conceptually in my work. But really they're another structure that allows me to paint and deal with the things that I'm interested in, in terms of um, applying material to a canvas and color. Um, so so they, they're both a device 
you know, that I think about um, conceptually, but that I can also paint in and out of. I also, um, you know, I often think about how you, you've told an anecdote around me several times around like, oh. <laughs> um, like uh -oh, um, about being in a lineage of people and specifically women making paintings on kitchen counters. Um, so that there's like this sort of, you know, like the treating the flatness of the surface as an object, right? Mm -hmm. Or treating the, the painting almost as though it's a table, right? That you're painting on top of instead of a window. I think is an interesting way of thinking about it, but it also then makes um, the flower enter into a kind of concrete material conversation around motif and decoration. And the way that decoration is not just about a kind of patterning or all over surfacing, but a, a concrete um, ideation. I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Oh, well, I think that you touched on something that I'm like really interested in and I love thinking about the horizontality too. Um, and I and I do paint my paintings flat and then move them up to the wall. Um, that is like, this is a studio shot. So just some things in progress um, that I'm working on and thinking about, but say like up in the top left, like that's a part of a chair. <laughs> and so I think about the things we live with and how they're adorned. I think about my contacts as like a, a woman from Pennsylvania, right? Who ha who's, I've gone through a real tactile experience of learning about visual culture of Pennsylvania and the Northeast. That's actually fairly specific in terms of um, decoration and functional decoration. Um, yeah, like, like these ink on paper drawings, um, emulating that and putting my own hand to it um, making it, it's a lot jauntier than some of those things. Um, but now I think about like how that can be applied to, um, you know, I, I think you have, do you have the hope chests in here too? Um, like these are on paper, uh, they're cut out. So they're actually shaped pieces of paper that are cut out. Um, and thinking about, you know, form and shape and how materials applied to it and how something is told through the history of an object and whether that's a painting or a drawing um, that kind of hand history uh, for this one kind of message history <laughs> you know I was thinking about the hope chests because I was also thinking about like the dowry and I was thinking about being a woman um, and the things you're supposed to have to be a woman, you know, and in antiquated terms and in like 2021 terms, I don't know, via Instagram or some nightmare hellscape that we exist in. Um, but the things that you would put in your chest that uh, validate your existence and uh, deem you worthy. Um, so I started trying to make these hope test drawings, um, but I also have like an intention or a desire to make the chests. Like I've been scouring local auctions lately looking for um, physical wooden chests that are in the style that Pennsylvania um, with specific kinds of make um, that I could paint myself and emulate and modernize um, potentially. This one leaves actually Jenny. This one was like my fall hope chest. Um, this was transitional season. I would you talk about those people, about color a little bit? Remember the other day we were talking about, about color? color. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and color in the drawings, you mean? How you, in the drawings and in the painting. Mm -hmm. How I was saying that, um, seems to me that you, your use of color is so free and on, uh, um, it, it's informal. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, it doesn't feel calculated. It's very intuitive. And, and the only thing I could compare it to was what I think about the way I use 
gesture and mark. Right. But I think you use color in a way that seems very remarkable to me. Well, I guess I think about color as, as balance. Um, I know that was something that, you know, Gabby, you brought up earlier, like in the questions was also like symmetry. Um, but I, I think about color as balance. When I'm painting, I'll mix out pretty much a set palette or have an idea of a set palette. Normally I, I source it from something I've seen that I'm like, oh, I love this. Like I take tons of pictures. I have folders of screenshots of things that I'm, I'm always like, why do I love this? Why am I attracted to this? Is it the balance in it? Is it the color? Is it the amounts and quantities and like percentages of color? But I think that when I'm building a painting, they're not quick paintings anymore. Um, but I think I'm just taking the time to achieve like a balance in the painting through color. Um, I think primarily in color and I could say that, you know, sometimes to a fault. Um, so then actually Gabby, I see you're scrolling down past like the black and white, <laughs> but sometimes I need to recenter myself like on with just ink. Like I was feeling at a total loss for a while, you know, like how stressful it's been um, as a human in this world this past year. And I needed a strategy to really locate uh, I don't know myself in any way. And so I was like, I need to just actually give myself a limitation because color sometimes can just get too stimulating. <laughs> and I think going with the black and white like provided me with real clarity. Um, of actually also the pleasure that I have in making marks and tempo and repetition um, and all of these things that build up together to create balance for me. Jenny, how do you think about color? Less and less. <laughs> I, I think that um, I think uh, more and more I just want to use work in black and white. I think it's the most, it's what I do best and most spontaneously. I mean, this happens to be a really singularly beautiful painting um, for me uh, in the way that um, I used color and I, I don't know if I can do that anymore right, or right now. Um, I've, I've gotten to the point where I put red in with the black and white and sometimes yellow, but that's as far as I go. And it only means, um, I just need something different. It's- um, Jenny, how big are these size-wise? This, this is big. This is um, six feet by seven. And the red painting? That was um, five. Five and a half by five and a half. Okay. Um, this, this red painting was one of the last paintings I did in oil. This and the, um, the other one, number 11. Yeah. Those are both oil. And then the next 13, 14 are both acrylic. I had reached a point where the paint, just um, not in those two paintings, but in the paintings I did afterwards, the paint was just dying on me. And so I went to acrylic 
because it was easier to work quickly and fast and I was able to keep the paint thinner and get the kind of um, gesture that I, I was always able to get in my drawings and that just died with oil paint. Um, this, was, this is also acrylic. This one, this is smaller. This is about um, three by four, I guess. Um, I was also, um, if you go back to uh, number 14, what, what interested me in the using acrylic was I was able to, to uh, cut up old paintings and put them and glue them onto the surface. So I was using medium, I was using paper, I was using, um, if you make that bigger, you can see there's like legal pads up in the yellow. The yellow is all legal. Oh my gosh. And and there's some logs from old log drawings. And these are all notes from, um, you know, lists of medicines I had to buy for my mother and, you know, reminders for my sister to do X, Y, and Z. And, um, and I could, I could work as freely with the acrylic on the canvas as I did um, on paper. I always felt like paper was my friend and a stretched canvas was much, much heavier. Um, Gabby, do you, wait, Gabby, do you mind if I ask a quick question? <laughs> Do you, like, are there, is any material in, like, like these notes, these legal pads, is anything like that fair game for you? I guess I wonder because you have, like, subject, right, which I know comes, like, from, like, cinema, from, like, books, and, you know, all of this stuff, but then there's, like, notes, uh, you know, about your mother's medications, and I wonder, like, is everything fair game? Uh, I'm just curious about about that for you materially? Like, do they just work as paint surface for you? Oh yeah, I never throw anything away. I mean, that's one of my problems <laughs> is that, you know, these recent drawings, if you look at the, a lot of them are, are made up of, 10, 15 year old drawings, not the pencil ones on the right, but um, like, uh, let me see if I can find, oh, like these leaves in the upper in the left. Upper. Gabby, can yeah, you do and that these again? Logs. I mean, they're at least 10, 15 years old stuff in there mm -hmm. on the paper. And I just, you know, I sort of put it in a pile and I, I don't want to throw it away. And, but I don't, it's not done. And, and just recently, you know, when I realized that what I needed to do was just focus on Theodore Dreiser's American Tragedy, I just started putting it all together. But yeah, like in, yeah, yeah. Jenny, I mean, this painting, this painting has, um, it started as a painting of a bunny playing an accordion. And it, and then I, 
the surface, it's acrylic. If you look at it, the surface is hideous. It's just very disgusting. Um, and I just decided, well, I'm just going to keep sticking stuff on it until I figure out what the story is here. And it went through, I mean, this painting took me years to figure out. Um, and, and American tragedy is on the right side going down and then across the bottom. But, you know, if you look at the curtain, um, Katie, I thought about you when I was looking at this painting the other day, because, you know, that's another thing that we both do. We both like to make frames and we both like to make not a window, but a, a kind of theater of activity. I mean, and, even to where you, I mean, the curtain, yes, yeah. of course, but even where you put, I love, I, and I hope to see this painting in person someday because I'm so curious about the disgusting surface. <laughs> yeah. but, but I love where you put Jenny Snyder Presents up at the top. Like that mark of like both the artist's signature like and, and the theatricality about it to me is just it's so cool Judy Bernstein, right? <laughs> I just I just love it. I just think that's like the most I just love that as the introduction to the painting and as the narrative entry point. Well, I have to tell you that part of the reason, I mean, figuring out that that was the title of the painting, that I was presenting Sergei Eisenstein's version of Theodore Dreiser's novel. It took me months to figure out that that's what all that stuff was about. But that I was the one who was making it. Mm -hmm. But the reason, the other reason I did that was, put my name in it was, because I once had a show <laughs> of my taxis. Um, there were a hundred wooden taxis all over the wall in the Bowery Poetry Club. Um, Elizabeth, it was when Elizabeth Murray was curating for her husband, Bob, this wall. And she asked me to put my taxis up. And so I did, and they were wonderful. And um, the woman who was my therapist went to see the show. And at our next meeting, <laughs> she was furious at me because I had neglected to put my name on the wall. <laughs> there was no announcement. <laughs> of who these cabs were by. This sounds and, complex, both as like your therapist brain was <laughs> to you. <laughs> what? For what? With your therapist bringing this to you as a problem. <laughs> and it sounds so layered. <laughs> well, I think I'm a very Baroque I have a very Baroque sensibility. <laughs> Jenny? Every part has a story. Yes, uh, sorry. One thing was, uh, what year was this painting made? This, this one started in uh, 2013, and I finished it in 2017. Okay. Um, and actually, I just wanted to make sure to get a question in from Rochelle, who wanted to ask about, um, I mean, I think this maybe feeds into a conversation around narrative and your sources, which you're already having. 
Um, but the question is about early film in relationship to color. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about the graphic imagery in your work. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Rochelle, yes. Um, well, you have to go back to uh, go back to keep going. Keep going to the dancers. There, number four. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you click on the middle, click. Gabby. Do you want her to zoom? Wait, no. no. It's, a, it's, it's not an animation. It's okay. not working. Let me pull it up, Jenny, because I reformatted. So I'm going to pop out, and then we're going to pop back in, OK? However, whatever. Cool. Great. So it's an animation? Yeah. <laughs> It's when was that? When was that made, Jenny? Soup to nuts. <laughs> the animation. Mm -hmm. um, Eighty-three. How old were you then? I wasn't here yet. Oh my! I'm God. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, a year later, I came into this world so I could find that animation someday. <laughs> But I do think that's a wonderful question, Rochelle, because um, oh, is it going to move now? There yes. Is. And just keep it going. You can just keep it going. Um, Okay, so I um, I think that the movies that I grew up with and that I loved as as a, as a young person. Um, were were black and white films um, and um, I've always been obsessed with film or no I was as a student more interested in film history than in art history um, because it was so much shorter, more compact and more available to me. And it was only really after I got out of school and began to look at real real, real stuff and follow my nose that I became involved with art history and, and understanding it. And when I was teaching, um, so Um, there's something about the moving image, the moving black and white image that is just imprinted in my sensibility. And, um, and you, your black and white uh, drawings when you first posted those on Instagram, mm -hmm. it 
reminded me of my own um, involvement with Pollock and the and that those drawings that you did sent me back to work in the studio on on the um, American tragedy stuff. Mm -hmm. It was looking at, at these drawings and remembering the pleasure of discovering a shape just out of the tip of a brush or a pencil. Mm -hmm. I mean, a pencil is still one of my favorite tools in the world. But, but also black paint on white paper is, is just a universe of feeling for me. Yeah, because then you can finally be present. Mm. All the noise, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, thank you both so much. Um, and I just wanted to be sensitive to time and say that we will end the kind of we ask you questions part of tonight's entertainment programming. <laughs> so thank you so much to Katie and Jenny. Uh, but really, we the conversation is just, to my mind, beginning. It's so like amazing to hear both of you talk about each other and to get into um, sort of the nitty gritty of both of your work. So I hope um, everyone will hang out and keep asking them questions and check in with one another 